Dr. Ken Landau, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Fizomax. Fizomax was described in 1978 and the Food and Drug Administration approved it for sale in the United States, 1995. It's among the top 100 drugs sold in the country and it's for the treatment and prevention of osteoporosis and postmenopausal women, sometimes in men, and in those people who are taking steroids, prednisone, at a dose of more than seven and a half milligrams a day for a considerable period of time. It also may be used in people who have a condition of the bone known as Paget's disease. It's estimated that about 40% of 50-year-olds currently alive in the United States are going to suffer at least one osteoporotic fracture during the course of the lifetime. Typically it's going to involve the spine, the vertebrae, and typically it's going to go unnoticed. It may involve the hip or the wrist or any other area of the bone. Now we know as a person goes from age 50 to 90, the risk of osteoporotic fractures increases quite dramatically so that there are going to be an estimated 300,000 osteoporotic fractures of the hip in the United States this year. Now there's a condition known as osteopenia. Osteopenia isn't normal but it's not yet enough to make the diagnosis of osteoporosis. That involves about 34 million people as opposed to osteoporosis itself that involves at least 10 million people in the United States. Osteoporosis, the bones are fragile because of a lack of substance and because of a lack of calcification of the substance that's in the bone. Now most people who have osteoporosis are going to have absolutely no symptoms and even if they suffer a vertebral fracture, a fracture of the backbone, they're not going to notice it. How do we make the assessment whether a person's at risk? Most people think that all you have to do is get a bone density scan. And if the bone density scan shows the number is low, then you have osteoporosis. But there's a lot more to it than just simply what a number shows from a DEXA scan. What we have to do is we have to consider a series of other things, your age, your sex, your weight, your height, whether you have a previous fracture, whether somebody in your family, a direct family member, mother, father, has a history of fracture, especially of premature fracture, whether you're a cigarette smoker, whether you're taking the steroids, do you have rheumatoid arthritis, do you drink too much, do you have a secondary cause of osteoporosis, do you have type 1 diabetes, do you have hyperthyroidism that's gone untreated, do you have low level of sex steroids, maybe you're a man and you have hypogonadism, or maybe you're a woman and you're ovaries were removed at a relatively premature age, you went through premature menopause, you have chronic liver disease, all of those factors matter. It's not simply, well, I have a low bone mineral density, I should take a pill. Well, if you are going to take a pill, the standard pills are Fosamax, it's sold generically as Alendronate, there also is Actinel, there's also Beneva, and there's also Reclast in the same family. We're going to talk about Fosamax or Alendronate comes in 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams, you can take that daily, or it comes in 35 milligrams or 70 milligrams, you take that weekly. You take the 5 milligrams to prevent osteoporosis, or you take the 10 milligrams to treat osteoporosis. Now, when you take the pill, you have to take the pill in a special way. You have to take it with at least 6 to 8 ounces of water and you have to do that first thing in the morning and you have to do that and then wait at least 30 minutes until you have any other kind of beverage or until you eat and you may not lie down for about 30 minutes or more after you take the pill and before you lie down you have to eat something. Pill has a lot of rules and regulations associated with it. If you can't sit upright or stand upright for at least 30 minutes, then you best not take the pill. And if you're at increased risk of aspirating, maybe because you have a kink in your esophagus, a stricture in your esophagus, or you have a condition known as achalasia, well, then you shouldn't take the pill either. There are some warnings and precautions associated with taking the pill. So we know that it can cause significant and severe irritation of the mucosa that lines the upper gastrointestinal tract, the stomach and the esophagus. It 
can cause hypocalcemia. Calcium level can go low, so you have to make sure that you have a sufficient amount of calcium in the system prior to the time you start taking the pill. When you take the pill, in some people, starting within a day or could be delayed a month, some people will develop severe joint pain, muscle pain, bone pain, can be even incapacitating. And more importantly and more scaringly, alarmingly, there are conditions known as osteonecrosis of the jaw, in other words, the lower jawbone dies or portion of it dies, or atypical femoral fracture, you're just standing around and your thigh bone breaks, osteonecrosis of the jaw, may occur spontaneously or more generally associated with maybe a tooth extraction or local infection. Maybe you've had a dental procedure, maybe you've had a dental implant, you're taking steroids, you have poor oral hygiene, you have ill-fitting dentures. Those are all risk factors. Also, people who are taking cancer chemotherapy and receiving the Fosamax or Fosamax-like medicines intravenously well, the Food and Drug Administration says that there's about a fourfold increase in the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw after you've been taking the pill for at least four years in comparison to if you're taking it for less than four years. And atypical femoral fractures, fracture of the thigh bone, a low energy fracture, low trauma fracture, you didn't do anything. You're standing around and all of a sudden your thigh bone breaks it can occur anywhere from the lesser trochanter around the hip to just above the knee and what we call the supracondylar flare. It's a transverse or a side-to-side -side fracture, sometimes an oblique fracture. You often have some prodrome. You have a little dull ache in your thigh or your hip or your groin. Can last for weeks or months before you have the fracture. Some people are taking steroids didn't know about this at the time the drug was approved in 1995, but you have to remember it's tested on relatively small numbers of people. Don't detect the rare side effects before it comes out on the general market. So after it's been out about five years or so, then that's when these atypical femoral fractures and the osteonecrosis of the jaw became apparent. The atypical femoral fractures occur in about one to 10 people in every 10,000. Usually to heal them, it requires some sort of surgical procedure. The drug company manufacturing the Fosamax, Merck, started talking to the FDA in about 2008 about what they should do, but they sort of presented the whole problem as a minor stress fracture, not as a serious, spontaneous, through and through fracture. So the Food and Drug Administration said, well, you don't have to really do anything, we don't have to change the label, but by 2010, the Food and Drug Administration was very concerned, and they said that there's a clear connection between taking the Fosamax or the alendronate, and developing these atypical femoral fractures, so they changed the label of the drug. Well, the incidence was noted first around 2005, then it made it to the papers, and then between 2008 and 2012, there was about a 50% reduction in the number of people who even wanted to take the pill. Well, some other limitations with the pill. It's not for children, it's not for pregnant women. It may interfere with the uh, ossification of the bones in the fetus, not for nursing women. And if you happen to have poor kidney function, probably not for you. Now, people who are taking the drug probably need to take a calcium supplement, and the calcium in your system, calcium in your blood, is going to decrease in a fair number of people on therapy, also decrease the level of phosphate in the system. Well, older people might need a little bit of vitamin D in addition. There's a problem, however, with the calcium supplements. I said you need the calcium supplements because theoretically the calcium is going to be put into the bone, but the calcium can interfere with the absorption of the pill. So we're sort of looking at a double-edged sword. And then we have the issue of the gastrointestinal sensitivity. Well, a lot of people are taking aspirin. Aspirin irritates the stomach and irritates the esophagus, so you've got to be a little bit careful of that. And it can cause, just the Fosamax can cause some um, additional issues of the lining of the esophagus and the stomach. It can cause problem with dysphagia, Difficulty swallowing, gastritis, duodenal ulcer, or perforation can cause some bleeding. And interestingly now, 
they're reporting an increased incidence of esophageal cancer associated with the pill. The Food and Drug Administration currently doesn't know exactly how to deal with the problem, what kind of label to add on, if any, but there is apparently an increase in the incidence of esophageal cancer. Well, how about some of the common side effects? The common side effects, more than 30% incidence in some people of abdominal pain or nausea or heartburn or constipation or diarrhea or flatulence. Or some people develop retrosternal chest pain because they didn't really swallow it with the appropriate amount of water. We've already talked about the muscle, the bone, the joint pain, and now they're describing atrial fibrillation that appears to be doubled in incidence in the people who are taking the medicine for a significant period of time. Well, obviously, if you're taking the pill and you develop any kind of side effects, well, you ought to stop and talk to your doctor. Once you take the pill, question is, how much is going to be absorbed? And the answer is not very much. It's six-tenths of one percent of the dose that you take is actually going to get into your system, assuming that you have an overnight fast and you take the pill first thing in the morning and you don't eat for two hours. But the instructions are don't eat for 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes. If you eat 30 to 60 minutes after you take the pill, it's going to be reduced from the 0.6% down maybe by about another 40%. And if you take it with a little bit of orange juice or with coffee, it's going to decrease the absorption from the measly rate by about 60% more. It's not metabolized. 50% is going to go out in the urine within about 72 hours. But the half-life of the pill, because it deposits in the bone and the new bone is laid down on top of it, the half-life of the medicine is about 10 years. How does the medicine work? Well, the bone is constantly being formed and destroyed. The cells that are responsible for bone destruction are known as osteoclasts. The osteoclasts are inactivated, some of them are inactivated, by the Fosamax. It prevents them from breaking down the bone, but there's a problem with that. And the problem is that the osteoclasts are joined in function with the osteoblasts, the cells that make the bone. So if you stop the one, you think, well, that's good. We're going to have the osteoblasts that are making the bone run wild. And ultimately, they're going to make a lot of bone. But that's not what happens because there's a linkage. So if you stop one, you're ultimately going to stop the other. So what's the story with all this extra bone mineralization that occurs? Well, it would appear that the extra bone density associated with taking pills like Fosamax may well be just the calcium getting in and mineralizing the bone that already was formed prior to the time you started taking the medicine. Now, if we look at the chemicals that get into the bloodstream that are associated with the manufacturing the bone, the breakdown of bone, we find that there's going to be a decrease in the urinary calcium, so that's good because theoretically it's going into the bone. And when we look at some of the markers that suggest the bone is being broken down, they are going to decrease. They decrease by about one month of taking the pill. They get to a plateau at about three to six months. They stay at levels about 50 to 70 percent less than prior to the time you took the pill. And once you stop the pill, they're going to return probably within several weeks to several months back to where they were. And if we look at the level of chemicals associated with bone formation, just like I said, since the two are linked, the levels of bone formation also going to be decreased. Now, when we talk about the function of the medicine, it's important to realize that most of the spine fractures, the vertebral fractures, the compression fractures, are going to be diagnosed on x-ray. It's not your complaining to the doctor, hey, I just fractured my back. No, that doesn't happen, except on a relatively unusual basis. About a third of the time, you have clinical symptoms. Two-thirds of the time or more, you don't have any symptoms. So let's take a look at people who are taking the Fosamax for a period of time, let's say for about three years, 
and let's look at the likelihood of them developing a new vertebral fracture versus people who are taking just a placebo. We find that one or more vertebral fractures will occur over a period of about three years in about 3% of the people taking Fosamax, 6% of the people taking placebo. So there's about a 3% difference. Now the company says, hey, that's about a 50% difference. Three to six. But no, it really is about a 3% difference. So that's not all that impressive. And if we look at the loss of height, if we're going to have these compression fractures of the vertebrae, you ought to shrink. And indeed, people who are taking the placebo shrink by about 4.6 millimeters over that period of time because of the compression of the backbone. But people who are taking the Fosamax shrink by about three millimeters. So it's pretty much the same. Now, if we look at the clinical fractures, the likelihood of clinical fractures of the vertebrae, we say that, well, about 5% of the people taking the placebo are going to have a clinical fracture where you go in and complain, hey, I got a sore back, versus about 2.5% of the people taking the Fosamax. So again, we're talking about a 3% difference in the rate. Now, if we look at the hip fractures, which are more important anyway, there supposedly is a major reduction by taking Fosamax in the likelihood of your suffering a hip fracture. And indeed there is. The drug company will tell you it's a 50% reduction. Now I don't know what you think about a 50% reduction, but that sounds pretty good until you hear that the 50% is going from 2% to 1%. That's the 50%. So you and I might say it's just a 1% reduction, but it's a 1% absolute reduction versus a 50% relative reduction. So that's not very impressive. And in fact, if we look at a little more than 1,000 women who are taking the placebo, we're going to find that about 22 of them are going to fracture the hip. So 980 are not going to fracture their hip. And if we look at the women who are taking the Fosamax, the number is pretty much the same. About 1,000 women out of 1,022 are not going to fracture their hip. Now, if we look at women who don't have any history of a vertebral fracture, and we give them some Fosamax, and we follow them over a period of time, well, they're at lower risk. So now the likelihood of a hip fracture in these women is only about 1.1%. And among the women taking the Fosamax, it's 0.9%. So if you haven't had a fracture and now you take the Fosamax for a period of four years, the likelihood of your reducing the incidence of hip fracture is only two-tenths of 1%. That doesn't sound very impressive at all. And if we look at the vertebral fractures, and these are diagnosed by x-ray, we find that about 2.5% of the women who are taking the Fosamax are going to have a fracture versus a little less than 5% of the women taking the placebo. So again, we're talking about what the drug company says is a 50% reduction, but you and I are going to say, well, it's only about a 2% reduction, 2.5% reduction. And that's if we look at the x-ray fractures. If we look at the clinical fractures, going to be significantly reduced from there. If we look at the likelihood of wrist fractures, well, statistically, it's sort of a dead heat. And in fact, in some of the studies, it shows that people taking the Fosamax might even have a little bit more, not statistically significant, but more fractures. So when it comes down to it, we have to say that the numbers don't seem to be all that impressive. We might have a significant increase in the bone mineral density if we do a bone scan, but who the heck cares whether the bone scan looks better or not? It's whether you have a fracture or not that's really the important issue. And if we look at the people who are taking the medicine for significant periods of time, it seems that the difference between the women who, say, take the Fosamax for up to 10 years versus take a placebo, if we look at the incidence of fractures, non-vertebral fractures and vertebral fractures put together, well, it looks like the incidence is really about the same. And as a matter of fact, whether you take the pill for five years or 10 years doesn't seem to make any difference because 
after several years, the Fosamax may well not only lose its positive benefit, but it might gain some negative benefit. And you have to realize all of the studies, or a significant number of the studies regarding Fosamax, were funded by the drug company. So we have to take their conclusions sort of with a grain of salt. Now, the question is how long should you take the pill? Well, the idea is osteoporosis is a condition that lasts forever. It's due to the aging of the bone. And the definition of osteoporosis is what's your level of bone density compared to a 20 or a 25 or 30 year old woman who has the peak bone mineral density. Well, guess what? It's going to be reduced, just like the level of your lung function, the level of your heart function, the level of your brain function is going to be reduced. So is your bone function. So the question is, how long do you continue to take the pill? And it would appear that about 60 or 70 percent of women who are taking the pill, certainly after three or four years, could probably stop. And as a matter of fact, the safety and efficacy studies only lasted about four years. So whether you continue the therapy or don't continue the therapy is an issue that you really need to discuss with your doctor because the long-term benefits might not be as impressive as people think. So let's add up the pluses and minuses. So if we look at absolute risk reduction, giving everything the best shot, we can say that the risk of hip fracture might be reduced by about 0.3% per year. Wrist fractures might be reduced by 0.4% per year. So less than half a percent reduction in the hip fracture and less than half a percent reduction in the wrist fracture. But atypical femoral fractures, especially if you take the pill for a long enough period of time, increase by about 0.1% per year. Osteonecrosis of the jaw increases 0.1% per year. Esophageal irritation injury increases about 0.1% per year. And esophageal cancer increases 0.02 to hundreds of a percent per year. So pluses and minuses have to consider. Now, a group out of France, Prescreer International, they evaluated taking the medicines for secondary prevention. So you've already suffered a fracture. Can the pills prevent another fracture? Well, they say it might, might be helpful. You would have to treat at least 37 women for at least three years to get any benefit. For primary prevention, however, so if you haven't had a fracture, they say there's not really any good evidence that taking the pill if you have osteoporosis and you haven't had a problem is going to do you any good. Another one called the Drug and Therapeutic Bulletin, they came out with an assessment. They said basically the same thing. For primary prevention, eh. Secondary prevention, well, it's even questionable whether you have any benefit. And then the therapeutic letter out of Canada, the Canadian official, uh, statement says primary prevention, if we look at women who are, let's say, 68 years old, well, it didn't really decrease the incidence of hip fracture or wrist fracture. And they looked at secondary prevention, now older women, say 72 years old, well, you're still going to have to treat at least 100 women for at least three years in order to get a 1% reduction in the incidence of the hip fracture and you would have to treat 77 women for the three years to get about a 1.3% reduction in the incidence of wrist fracture. And they say the studies are biased. Remember, the drug company is doing them. So you can't even accept that those numbers are legitimate. So in the end run, what do we do? Well, we keep looking and we look and find a Cochrane study. Cochrane study is an international organization that rates the drug studies. And it tells us what's a good idea and what's a bad idea. And actually, in three Cochrane reviews, they found no significant decrease in the risk of hip fractures for primary prevention and maybe a teeny weeny, statistically significant, but maybe not clinically significant decrease in hip fractures in somebody who's already had a particular problem, a problem with osteoporotic fracture. Now, there's another issue, and the issue is, let's say we're putting all this calcium into the bone and making it thicker. 
since we're not actually manufacturing bone, because remember, we're not stimulating the osteoblasts, this is an anti-resorptive medicine that cuts down on the breakdown of bone. If we throw a bunch of calcium in there, and we think we have extra thick bone, what we might be doing is hypermineralizing bone and actually making it weaker and more likely to fracture in the long run, and that's might might be where the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the atypical femoral fractures all come from. So something that you might want to consider, whether we're making a significant inroad by taking a pill like Fosamax. Fosamax is pushed quite heavily, but the data behind it is surprisingly weak. So if you want to prevent osteoporosis, you want to treat osteoporosis, consider your diet, consider exercising, consider fall avoidance. We know that there are certain pills that people are taking. We give pills all the time. The benzodiazepines, the sleeping pills. We use the antidepressive pills. We use the pills that are treating our bipolar disorder, our mania, our depression. And those things all increase the risk of falling. Or we take pills because we're on steroids for something. Or we have a little indigestion and we're taking Prevacid or we're taking Prilosec or we're taking a diuretic, a loop diuretic, not a thiazide diuretic, but a loop diuretic. All of those things are going to increase the potential for osteoporosis and for falls and for fractures. So do be careful. There are a lot of things you can do other than take pills. But the good news is that since the drug has become generic and since the drug company can't make any money so the Merck is not in the business anymore, all of these are generic drugs, alendronate, and they're very inexpensive. So you can buy them for less than about twenty or thirty dollars a month and that's probably a pretty good bargain. So osteoporosis is a hot topic. We have a lot of pills that are being pushed to get rid of osteoporosis, but you have to realize that nobody gets rid of osteoporosis. You can treat osteoporosis, and the question is, do we treat it well? And the answer is, well, Fosamax and pills like that decrease at best some of the bone resorption but they don't really stimulate bone. They don't make it thicker. And what we need to do is we need to make bones thicker. Fortunately, there are some new medicines on the market that have made Fosamax and other drugs like it probably second rate, second tier. And we do have to worry about people taking these drugs for too long a time period and maybe suffering some consequence of the drug. So anyway, if you're interested in the topics, there's a video we did on Forteo, another one on Venity, some on osteoporosis. Why don't you watch them? Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.